Hours later I was driving a much drunker Hiromi home. A night out had been nice. We all ended up sharing the stories of what happened to us over the past weeks. We all shared the good and the bad, and in the end, we actually felt like tunes. It was really nice. Pulling up to Hiromi's apartment, it took a bit of cajoling to get the drunk girl out of the car, and eventually I was forced to princess carry her as she kept falling and giggling. Did I mention she was drunk? It was a little awkward knocking on the door to her apartment, waiting for someone to answer. Her mother didn't say a word, just an unhappy glare as I carried her almost snoring daughter into the apartment. After a minute of settling her on her bed, making sure she was laying on her side and finding a trash can that would work as a bucket, I hurried out of the dark apartment under the heavy eyes of the corpo woman. But I was safe. I escaped back out to the city where there weren't angry corpo mom glares. Instead there was freedom. I mean sure freedom sounded like NCPD sirens, which still hadn't entirely let up. The NCPD were practically leaving the sirens going through the night just to make sure their presence was felt. But I shook that feeling away. Time to go home. I was humming when I got home. Never fade away drifting in the air as I walked into the apartment and threw up a hand to say hello to June who was sitting on the couch when he leapt from the couch startling me. Motoko. What happened? Are you okay? Who did this? I'll kill them. What? I asked before blinking, reaching up to my nose. Right. Bar fight. I forgot. Sure the pain was there, but it was so little, I wasn't even paying attention to it. Considering how high my cold blood skill was, it wasn't even enough I needed to really use the skill to not feel it. And a night's sleep would set me right. Fuck. Ah. Uh, you should see the other guy. Much to my shock this did not set my brother at ease. Who did this? He demanded in a growl holding onto my shoulders. Some gonks at the club. Hiromi annoyed them by talking or something, and they decided to start a fight. It's okay June, really. It was kind of fun honestly. Besides, I won. I inform him ending in a bright smile as I managed to shake off his hands a bit so I could flex my arm. Not that I had any natural muscle, there, but the image was important. The club? Ho? Huh? Yeah. Some TC gongs. They touched you? You? He growled and I realized June was actually getting pretty pissed, like psycho level angry, not his usual hot headedness. So I reached up and grabbed his face between my hands. Hey. June come on, come back. Everyone is fine. Deep breaths June knee. Deep breaths. I ordered, and while he instantly looked to fight, I didn't let him. Chrome hands were strong, June knee. You back with me? He let out a long breath out of his mouth that came out more of a hiss than anything else. I never left, he snapped back, but I could tell he was back. His eyes were seeing me and not anyone else. Right. I chirped at him as I let go, getting glared at all the while. They should not have touched you. Not a tiger claw. I kinda beat their ass June. Plus it was fun. Tisk. Ho club? That means. Jotaro Shobo? That is the man in charge there? Yeah good memory. Hiromi and I had a bit of a run in with him after the bar fight. He was super mad. Talking about punishment and stuff. Ichi showed up then, and name dropped the kamikaze. I'd rather him not spread around that I worked with them, but it made Mr. White suit back off. The devil of Kabuki, said he would punish you? I'll kill him. June growled, his fists clenching and unclenching as he must have imagined murdering the Davy. Devil of Kabuki? I asked before I felt it. Realization. Jotaro Shobo. The devil of Kabuki. The devil of Kabuki. Jotaro Shobo. That disgusting motherfucker I cut myself off as my own hands clenched and I had to rely on cold blood to keep from punching walls and cursing up a storm. I remembered that fucker now. I had only done that quest once. But I remember. The Mox had wanted him dead, because he was a monster. That motherfucker kidnapped people only to torture them to make XPDs. I made XPDs as well, but I murdered people that deserved it. Not kidnapped people that hadn't done anything. Not people just down on their luck nabbed by assholes like Jotaro Shobo. You know of him? June suddenly asked, pulling me out of my rapid-fire thoughts as I stopped my pacing in the living room. Yeah. 
I've heard of the devil of Kabuki before. And the fucked up shit he does. I muttered. All the times I had met Jotaro Shobo sliding into my realization. Of course I remembered the hot club now. I had thought the name was familiar. It was where you go to kill the devil of Kabuki. A job that. Regina? The fixer gives you on behalf of the Mox. Jotaro had no problem kidnapping even Moxes to scroll XPDs of. Jotaro Shobo? Jotaro Shobo was a dead man walking. The decision was made. All I had to do was figure out how I wanted to get it done. Loud or quiet? No, I took a breath. I would need some advice on this. This would be complicated. Very very complicated, my connections with the TC was useful at times, and at others it was a noose. So I shook the disgust at myself for talking to that man, and not knowing a way. I was in the moment. It's okay June I told him, June having been hovering around as I went off in my own head at the realization of who I had been interacting with. Doesn't seem okay, Motoko? Emoto? June asked, his face worried and I could see the stiff way he held his hands as if wanting to grab me, but not sure if he should. Really June Ni? I'm okay. I think I'll probably go talk to Waikoko tomorrow about it. Might get some advice. But, I guess I just wasn't really ready. To actually been hanging around someone like that, and I hadn't even noticed. Of course. The truth was worse than that. I had forgotten. Jotaro Shobo was a monster, but only a side quest. A little gig you could do, that unless you actually paid attention, you wouldn't even need to hear the guy's name. How many horrible people, monsters, or evil things happened in the game that I wasn't remembering? I brushed past June and headed into my room. I had taken to mostly sleeping on the couch surrounded by parts and pieces of my tinkering or my laptops to grind with, but what I needed now was no distractions. I sighed once the door closed behind me. I started stripping weapons settled on a dresser, their holsters ready to be buckled on when I got dressed, as I slipped out of my leotard, out of my armored clothing that made me feel like a badass, and into something comfy. Then I sat on the bed and laid back. What else did I forget? So rather than sleep, rather than spend a night grinding, I started thinking back to the game, to the anime, to everything I hadn't been thinking about as I'd been either having too much fun grinding, or too murderous to think about. Jotaro was just one mission. Were there any other gigs that I should remember? So I started thinking back. The first thing that popped into my head? That fucking sick fuck, I gasped remembering the farm. River and his stupid quest. The creepy fucking cartoon that I swore if I ever had to watch again I was gonna uninstall the damn game. The creepy bastard and his farm. Fuck. I don't remember the name of the farm. I would have to jump onto the map I had installed, and see if I can't find it. Hopefully it will actually be listed. I took a deep breath and let it out. Okay. That was one thing that needed to be dealt with, maybe even sooner than Jotaro. What else? Wait. That scav ripper. Shit. I can't remember what his name was, but he shouldn't be hard to find. He had an open ripper shop. Hopefully he is already set up, and I'll go and put an end to his bullshit. Anyone willing to pretend to be a doctor only to rip them apart for pieces for scavs deserved a messy death. Maybe even get some more scav den data from it. That made me think of fingers. He was disgusting, and I definitely felt like putting a bullet in his head, but he wasn't scaving people. Just being a disgusting molesting fuck. But the joy toys that go to him, do it because he was cheap thanks to what he did. I would have to talk to Vic. He would know best. Would killing fingers actually be a net good? Fuck. This is why I said I wasn't a hero. I don't like these kinds of complex good and evil choices. I hated good and evil alignment choices in games. I guess. I guess it was good that I didn't have one. I couldn't think of anything else directly relevant at the moment. Except for edge runners. Faraday was on my list too. That four-eyed fucker needed to get put in the dirt, but he was dangerous. He had plenty of guards. That was enough for now. I had my targets. I should sleep. Let the night pass and be ready the next day. But that kidnapping fuck was out there. Right now. I pulled up my map. Farms in the Badlands, it took an hour to narrow down my options. Unfortunately it had been way too long since I had actually played 2077. 
I didn't remember which farm it was and despite most of them closing down, there were still a few of them around the city. So I had a list. I would just hit all of them until I found it. I should sleep. I could do it. Just a push of a button and I would be out for eight hours. But my knee was bouncing. My fingers tapping. Every piece of me wanted to get up and go kill that creepy fuck. Fuck it. I wasn't some hero, but I wasn't going to let that bastard live for another day if I could help it. Making me watch the creepy cartoon in the game was enough to earn his death certificate, even without the kidnapping and creepy shit he does. I got up and started packing my equipment back on. I stepped out as Isaac the leotard back up to see June was still up watching TV with a half-eaten burrito in his hand. I thought you went to bed? He asked, noticing I was arming back up. I even had my necromata over my back. I was. But something came up. Don't wait up for me. I might not come back in before morning. Might take a while to find him. I say as I finish strapping everything on and walk over to June to give him a kiss on the cheek. I'll see you later. The hand gripping the back of my jacket kept me from walking. Not a chance. It's late. What are you doing? Gotta kill a guy. Gonna take a while to hunt him down first. I answered truthfully which unfortunately didn't turn me my release. Details. Now, he said standing up to block my way. Fine. I got some info on a serial killer. Some crazy fuck that kidnaps kids does weird shit to them. I know. Generally where he is. Gonna need to hit a few locations to find him, but I'm going to assassinate him, and rescue anyone he has kidnapped. June blinked at my response. My reveal obviously surprised him as he seemed to mull it over. Fine. I'm coming too. I sighed. I really didn't need June and his big stompy feet following me around. Ju Yuan. Whined at him irritated at him trying to interfere in my mer assassination. It's an assassination. One is a job, the other is mental sickness. No. It's late, and I know I can't talk you out of leaving he said standing up and looming over me. Since I know how you are, I'm coming with. Someone to watch your back. Fine. I'll wait for you to get ready. It's gonna be more of a stealth job you know? The guy has like a ton of mines and turrets defending his farm last I heard. He looked at me for a moment and then he slapped the back of my head. If that is the case you definitely need someone there to watch your back. Emoto. You can rely on me. You have other tombs as well. Stop trying to take on everything alone. He added as I gaped at him as he walked off. I can handle myself just fine. I called out to him, but he ignored me as he headed into his room to grab his gear. I stood there at the door a little huffy rubbing the back of my head. Jerk. Stupid face. A few minutes later June walked out, yawning a bit as he was now kitted up in his kamikaze gear, face mask included. I rolled my eyes and headed down. June following after. June kept yawning so I actually stopped at a vending machine and bought a couple of drinks stuffing a few into his arms, making sure they were the type he liked before heading to the garage. He didn't say anything but he was giving me an amused smirk as he followed after. Shut up. I didn't say anything. He replied instantly, but he was still smirking. Jerk. We reached the car, but June was walking over towards his kusanagi. June. Come on. I pointed at my car as I set the cans down on the roof for a moment as I opened the door and started arranging my nekamata. I'll just follow you, he said side eyeing me. Not a chance. We are leaving the city. Unless you want to drive your kusanagi through the badlands? I asked, and I saw him wince a little. North Carolina streets could be bad enough with potholes, and general debris, but the roads out of the city were. Rough. The nomads drove their cars with off-road tires, and alterations for a reason. Like my quadra. Come on. Just. Drive slowly, he demanded, as he relented and moved to the passenger seat. I always drive safely. Dash. Driving out of the city was easy enough. It wasn't like many people drove out of Night City in the middle of the night. If only June would stop trying to change the radio. June if you change my radio to that garbage one more time, I'm gonna start driving fast just to end this torture. I told him out of the corner of his eye. June wasn't a fan of oldies which samurai were. Technically. I mean they were over 50 years old. 
Of course kids that grew up in North Carolina thought the music was for old people. They just had no taste. The original sounds? Johnny might be a real piece of shit, but he had some monster vocals and guitar work. Uck. Why do you listen to this scop? It's terrible. He grumbled at me. As someone who listens to us cracks, you have no right to talk about my music preferences. Us cracks are at least modern. I groaned as the argument went around again. But I finally had an actual distraction. Heads up, I said suddenly turning off the engine. The headlights had already been turned off as we left the city. My Kiroshi could see just fine and there wasn't exactly a lot of traffic. June sat up from where he had been slouching in the seat. What is it? First of the potential targets. Poppy Farm. Be careful. If this is it, the crazy fucker put up mines. You already told me, he said, rolling his eyes. I won't forget a warning about landmines Motoko. I nodded but I was narrowing my eyes. The road went right past the only structure around. I frowned as I noticed the fires highlighting the massive graffiti covering the front. Wraiths. Not exactly what I was looking for. This isn't it. I admitted as we cruised down the road without a sound. No mines. No defenses. But wraiths. A couple of wraith vehicles parked around, a barrel on fire lighting up the exterior. A few milling around drinking beers. You sure? Yeah. Not this farm. Still tempted to clear them out though. I admitted. They were obviously winding down, sitting around drinking or sleeping. They wouldn't know what hit them. Starting a firefight for what? Emoto. As I learned. You need to bank the fire of your bloodlust, he said, surprising me. The car finally came to a stop, still invisible to the wraiths in the night but I looked away from the farm to June. Okay, who told you that? That didn't sound like you at all, I demanded and to my delight he actually looked a little embarrassed. Sensei. I snorted before chuckling at him, June was soon pouting at me. All right. All right. I guess. I guess we can just ignore them, I said, sighing a bit. Fucking wraiths. I didn't say that. June offered after a few moments and I blinked at him, as he smirked at me. I simply wanted to be sure you weren't rushing into a fight for nothing. What do you hope to gain? Numbers? No, I couldn't exactly tell him that. Plus. He was right. Morgan's solo guide. That book I never even finished reading way back when. I had taken some of the words to heart, made my rules, only to forget them when I got kidnapped. I wasn't some psycho, killing for fun. I was a merc. A solo. Someone that did what she did for a reason, and what reasons do I have for killing a bunch of wraiths? I know a nomad. We clear this camp, we can let him know. Probably make some good eddies for the sale of the wraith cars. That plus we get any weapons, and eddies the wraith have on them. And what is the risk? I blinked. Risk? From a bunch of sleeping wraiths in the middle of the night? June you are vastly overestimating those gonks, or underestimating me. I could probably kill every wraith in that camp without them ever knowing I was there. His quirked eyebrow told me he didn't believe me. I felt an actual smile stretching my lips. I bet you complete control over the radio, I can do it. I offered which surprised him for a moment but then he chuffed out a laugh. If you can't, I control the radio not just on this trip, but from now on. I winced. If I messed up and had to listen to the US cracks and the pon pon shit or something, I might actually go cyber psycho. But proving I was a badass and winning a bet against June? Totally worth the risk. Deal. Just stay here. Unless you hear gunshots. Shouldn't take me long. I told him, then I looked forward and blinked as I activated the BD recorder. Might as well get another benefit from this little side quest. Then I slipped out of the car and into the darkness of the dusty desert road. Cactus and bushes surrounded me, and I could hear the sound of a radio in the distance. My blood turned to ice as I crept forward. My eyes let me see just fine, but it was because of that, that I knew I had to be even better. If even one wraith had good optics and noticed me creeping along, June would win our bet. Plus they would shoot at me. That too I guess. But as I moved in closer and closer stalking amongst the bushes and cactus, I knew this would work. 
these guys were even more confident than the Maelstrom had been. After all, the Raffin were the predators of the Badlands. As much as the nomads liked to talk big and tough, the Raffin were feeding on the nomads, not the other way around. So I crept in. My eyes flashing in scans looking for any defenses, only to find nothing. Not even cameras. Just nothing. Just a few Raffin outside, and probably more inside. So I crept closer every inch of my body working in tandem to keep me out of sight. To keep me quiet. Until I was in the shadows of the barn. I slipped inside. No one noticed. No one even heard my footsteps as I slipped around the open barn doors and I was inside. The lights inside were old. Most didn't work. A perfect environment for my work. I went to the far back of the barn. Just to check for any security. Nothing. Just a few of the old barn stables filled with tents, or sleeping bags. This was obviously not the Raffin's home. Just a place to spend the night despite the giant painted on wraiths outside the barn. Their vehicles were also inside. I went around to each of them just to make sure they were all empty. All but one. The poor Raffin sleeping in his back seat didn't notice me as I poked my head over the side door to stare at him for a moment. His door was locked. His security wasn't good enough to stop me. I didn't even bother closing the door when I was done just pulling him mostly out of the car so he wouldn't bleed on the interior. Then it was time. The poor Raffin was split up. Sleeping or hanging around drinking and whiling the night away. It made sense. It was getting late. A glance at my integrated clock in my Kiroshi, something I didn't tend to think about, showed the time. 2.07 a.m. A good time. The second guy lost his life to a knife through the throat while he was sleeping in his little sleeping bag. The next I killed by cutting through his tent rather than trying to unzip it. He died just as quickly. I didn't feel much as I slowly cleaved through the sleeping raven. They weren't even a threat as the sleeping men died one after another. Six sleepers in total. 3000 XP. Then I had to deal with the three outside. I considered how to do it. They were split apart, but all chatting with each other. Difficult. I could grab my gun, but that wasn't how I wanted to run this. So I turned back inside and searched a few of the corpses for what I wanted. I smiled as I found plenty of what I needed. Then I stood up from the shadows. I loved stealth. I loved sneaking around, but there was something truly freeing about walking openly out of the barn up to the first guy who was sitting down on some old garbage. One of his buddies noticed me as I walked up to him and let my knife slam into his throat and out. My other hand was already moving. The knife I had looted whistled through the air, hitting. Mostly where I wanted. It was a little off. I really needed to up my reflexes some more. On the other hand, even as one man died, and the other gasped as a blade appeared in his chest I was pulling a third blade from my waist. With a little flourish I lined it up even as the third Raffin tried to react. Tried to rise up and draw her rifle sitting at his side. The whistling blade put an end to that, as she fell crying out breathlessly. I swiftly threw another blade, this one actually landed where I wanted. Her throat suddenly blocked by a solid piece of metal put an end to her as she writhed on the floor dying. I had checked every inch of the inside of the farm and I hadn't seen any of them wandering around in the night so I was fairly confident I was done. My eyes turned gold. Motoko? I reached down and slipped my blade into the second Raffin's throat, he was bleeding out on the ground a knife in his chest, lung pierced, but I put him out of his misery as I answered June. All clear June knee. Come on over, let's loot up. I told him before dropping the call. I could hear my Quadra's engine start up a few moments later as the car rumbled off the road and towards the farm. Perfect. Loot. XP. And I could send a message to Scorpion. Maybe the old Ecaldos could use a few more cars? I peeked into the barn noticing there were a few Raffan vehicles now ownerless. Damn, June whispered behind me as I turned away from the barn to see him already walking amongst the corpses. With a motion he tugged free the knife in the Raffan's throat. Bringing it up to his face he looked it over. I remember. When you were practicing that, he said sounding a little off. I uh, spent some time on it. It's a useful skill. I lied. I really hadn't done much knife throwing since I played with it so long ago, but the instincts, the experience, 
The muscle memory was all part of ninjutsu. I could practically feel the blade still between my fingers. The motion I had made to throw it. I hadn't even thought about it. Just did what I knew was right. Well. You cleared them out all right. Go ahead and look around June, might find something you want. I'm gonna call Scorpion. Scorpion? June asked but I ignored his question as I turned away from him, took a few steps away and felt my eyes turn gold again. I felt my foot tapping away for a while as Scorpion didn't pick up at the first ring, or the second, or the tenth. Finally the call connected, and a grumpy voice came over the line. Fucking hell. What? Do you have any idea what time it is? Scorpion cursed and grumbled on the line but I smiled. Hey Scorpion, you still need a car? I asked ignoring his complaints, I was trying to do him a favor after all. What? I rolled my eyes at his question, the man must have been asleep he was really being slow to catch on. Wait Motoko? Why are you calling so late? Come on Scorpion keep up. Do you still need a car? Or rather any of the older Caldos? I have. Six. Raffin vehicles that are now ownerless. You or your family want them? What? I snorted, at least this time it was a what of surprise, and not just pure confusion. I let the call stay silent for a minute. Fuck you hit another Raffin camp? He asked blearily, obviously struggling to think. More like a pit stop. I was searching for someone else, and ran into them. So you want the vehicles? I'll give you a good deal for them. Fuck. Yeah. Hold on. Give me. Give me a minute. I need to wake up. He grumbled a bit and the line went silent, as he must be paying attention to something other than the call. While I waited I turned towards the bodies and started looting them. Each of the men of course had a weapon, rifles or shotguns seemed to be the preference. I looked through the growing pile of weapons with an interested eye. I certainly didn't need much else, but it was always nice to see if there was something interesting among the chaff. I didn't find anything I wanted to add to my growing armory, but I did find a few pieces of interest. Optics, or little mods that I quickly uninstalled on the weapons and checked into the Quadra's trunk. I could have some fun with some of that. Motoko. You there? Course Scorpion, feel a bit more awake? Yeah at least I'm alive. You said you had six vehicles? I didn't respond right away, instead looking into the barn and taking a picture of the vehicles all parked. Then sent that. Yep. Holy. Prem. Very prem. Motoko, you know we don't have the cash reserves for all of them, but I, well I'm still stuck on my bike, I wouldn't mind an actual roof over my head. That's fine, listen if you can come pick them up, we can count it as an IOU. I don't really want to try and hold these until other Rathan decide to come find out where their buddies are, and I don't have the desire to try and sell them to a bunch of gonks. Pay me what you can, and maybe we can barter out some other stuff, but I know you're reliable so I gave you a call. The line went silent at my offer for a long while. Long enough I started to wonder if I had lost connection. Scorpion? Yeah. Yeah I'm here. Fuck Tum. I don't know what to say. Say you'll come take these off my hands and pay me what you can later. I told him with a laugh which I got an almost strangled sound in turn. All right. I'll get the older Kaldos together. We'll come take them off your hands, won't be difficult to get them repainted and keyed to us. Listen. Kid, I still owe you one. A big one, and this. I'll pay you back somehow. I promise. Don't stress so much Tum. Getting these out of the hands of Raffin is already a lot. Listen I gotta run. I'll send you the coordinates, but I'm in the middle of something. Don't have time to hang around. Yeah, of course. I'll. I'll keep in touch. Don't hesitate to come by if you ever need something. Motoko. Are we going to be waiting around all night? June asked, interrupting, and I threw him a one moment gesture at him. I gotta run. Stay safe Scorpion. You too kid. I nodded, as I finally disconnected. Okay. Ready to go? Loot anything good? I asked him but June just shook his head. I just clept some eddy shards. They didn't have anything I wanted. Preem. Follow me then I want to find that serial killer fuck before he can target anyone else. I jogged over to the car pointedly ignoring Jernt's eyebrow as he looked around at the dead bodies around him. Dash. 
We drove to another farm nearby only for another miss. While I drove I was looking over my stat screen. Since there was no traffic out in the badlands it was easy enough to split my attention. 4500 XP from the Raffin. None of them were big guys, so I only got 500 XP ahead. Still that leveled me up again. Level up achieved. One stat point gained. One skill point gained. Level 9. Of course as much as I wanted to start spamming stats again. I knew the rule. So the stat point was immediately dropped into adaptation for my arms. I twitched a little as the point went through. A coolness in my chest that I realized had actually been impacting my breathing as I tried to naturally shy away from the cold, eased. I inhaled, and exhaled. Feeling. Better. One more step. But what was I gonna do with all these skill points? I had four of them saved at this point, and that was a lot. But I didn't really need to spend it on anything. Most of my skills were getting close to the stat cap, or they were something I would grind once I had some better tools. Looking at you quick hack. One of these days I was gonna get an upgrade to my net deck and get some actual toys. In the end I just pushed it away. I would think about it when I wasn't mid-hunt for a serial killer. Okay we are coming up on the next potential place. Keep your eyes open. I told June, who had been yawning for a while. Poor June was sleepy. We were coming close to 3 in the morning after all. Lights off I turned off my engine as we started coasting down the empty road. I had been forced to head back into the city and go out a different exit just to get to this point. Edgewood Farm. The name was sort of foggy familiar. So I was really hoping this was it. As we approached I noticed the large gate surrounding the area, and while that didn't ring any bells in my head, as we coasted past the entrance, I saw it. Mines. June. I saw it. This the place? Yeah. I muttered as I let the car keep drifting down the way a bit farther from the farmhouse and barn so that when I braked it was as quiet as could be. Alright we gotta be careful. No kidding. How are you going to get around the mines? Slowly. I told him with a laugh. We both stepped out of the car and headed towards the gate. I crept up to the edge of the locked gate waving June back as I started scanning. First I needed to turn off those cameras. A security camera was over the entrance to the farmhouse. I started breaching in through the quick hack, but noticed the problem pretty quickly. This psycho was a netrunner. Or at least good enough that his defenses weren't easy to break through. I pulled back. I wasn't breaking into the camera's defenses without setting off an alert, and that was something I didn't want to happen. Motoko? June whispered and I shook my head. Defenses on his stuff is tight. Give me a minute. I told him as I thought. I could try to get around to the camera to breach it directly. I could try to sneak into the little house, but no telling what he had set up there. And I would be in direct view of the camera. So what can I do? Wait. I don't need to do this silent. He was one guy in the middle of nowhere. I just needed to draw him out. June I'm going to draw him out and then just headshot this fucker. Once he is down, we can get through his defenses at our own pace. Okay. I'm with you, he said and I threw him a thumbs up as I hurried back to the car. I had left my Nekamatu inside. Quickly pulling her free I rushed back to the entrance. I might not be able to break into the camera, but I could get Amine to go off. Once I settled back in I grabbed a rock, and with a smack hucked it over the wall right towards Amine I had already spotted. The explosion was deafening in the silent night. A moment later two turrets popped out of the ground near the barn. I wanted to whistle but kept silent as they started searching around. Automatic lights also activated lighting up the farm. But then silence. I could feel June getting jittery behind me as I just waited for it. I was backed up just enough that the camera couldn't spot me, or the barrel of the Nekamatu as I kept it pointed at the front door of the little farmhouse. He had to be here. It was so early in the morning. Then a few minutes later the door opened. Well I didn't remember the guy from the game, but he was in the right place at the right time. He stepped out onto the porch. Looking around grumpily. He was looking towards the smoking hole where the mine used to be when I took the shot. The sharp retort of my railgun broke the night, and the man's body flopped. I hope you're right, June said from behind me. But I already knew I was. 
750 XP gained. The only time I gained 750 was for people that weren't borged out, but were still dangerous in some way. Netrunner, bosses of men. And now serial killers. I stepped out and took aim. The HMG turrets each took two shots as they buzzed around trying to locate what was shooting at them before they came apart. All right stay close June I'm gonna hack these mines as we go. I opened the gate by pulling it open. With Jern's stupid gorilla strength helping out, and then the minefield. My eyes shifted as I scanned the first mine. Working on its eyes to try and break through. I didn't in fact break through. I was glaring a few minutes later when I realized that military ice designed for landmines probably wasn't off the shelf ice. Motoko? Just. Just stand back. I grumbled pulling out the Lexington in my back holster. While I couldn't break through the ice, I wasn't worried about someone coming out to check anymore. I started firing, blowing a path through the mines. Thankfully the entrance of the barn didn't have any mines right out front even if it was locked down. There just weren't any ways to actually get in. Wait here. I told June as I turned around and headed for the farmhouse. He definitely had a way in from inside. I passed the dead body without a glance. I started searching, nothing on the first floor, just old trash and a living room. Upstairs though? A bedroom, with a big computer system. I accessed it without any trouble. The security ignored. The system was already unlocked and opened from being in use. But there wasn't an access point. Just lots of emails, both to his victims and a saved folder full of saved pictures from the news and other media about the meat man. Fucking sick. I guess this guy had a nickname to the media. So I stopped looking through his personal computer. There had to be something more. With a bit of exploration I found a switch behind the computer desk. As I pressed it, a hidden door opened. Leading to another little secure room including the barn access controls. A few moments later I could hear the doors rolling up outside, and I wasn't going to stick around inside. I rushed out, June nowhere to be seen as I rushed to the barn keeping an eye out for mines. There was June, inside standing next to A. Well it was a person with that creepy gas mask on. Only this mask wasn't to keep the gas out. It was meant to pump oxygen and other chemicals to cows. Only now it was worn by some teens and it wasn't oxygen they were inhaling. I took a few moments checking the system before I realized I would need to shut down the entire system from the source in order to unhook the two people inside. Stay with them, be ready to pull that tube off when I tell you. I called out to June as I rushed towards the back finding the control room, idly putting a fist into the TV that had that fucking cartoon playing. It only took a moment to find the right switch and the whir and noise of the air system suddenly quieted. Do it now. Rushing back out onto the main barn June was pulling the mask off one of the people. I hit the other. A few seconds and I had the boy inside free. He didn't make a sound as I pulled the mask from his face, checking his pulse. Slowly I felt it. A weak beating. That one alive? Yeah. Okay I'm going to call NCPD. I told him, earning a hesitating nod from June. I dialed the number and a few moments I was put to a recorded message, and not even a person. That was so NCPD I couldn't believe it. I went through the menu needing to select three options and pay a 10 ED bill, before the line connected. NCPD what is your emergency? I have two young men that have been kidnapped and pumped full of some kind of drug by a psycho. This guy's definitely a serial killer. These two are alive, but I doubt they are his only victims. Estimated wait time for a patrol vehicle is 45 minutes to your current location. Thank you. Hold on. These kids might be dead in 45 minutes. Look at this. I backed up and took a picture before sending it down the line. Miss, we don't accept pictures. Nor will NCPD alter our deployment speed. Another 10 eddies will be deducted from your account for the lengthened call. Thank you foe. This is the meat man. The serial killer. Don't sit there and tell me no one is interested in that. The line was quiet for a moment. Please hold. I blinked. Well that was easy. A minute or so later the call was answered. This is Detective Stints. If this is a game, I'll bash your skull in. That was. Certainly an introduction. It's not. 
I have two people that were kidnapped and drugged, and a dead psycho serial killer that is probably your meat man. At the least he had practically every news article mentioning him saved to his personal computer. I just need an ambulance to come get these people before they die. You tried to send a picture. Send it to me now. I didn't just send that. I sent that picture another about the location including the mines and the dead body. The line was quiet for a few minutes. I'll be on my way. A patrol car will be there soon. Stick around. I'll have questions. Sure. Just make sure they know about the mines. I'll clear up as many of them I can. But this guy was crazy. I'll make sure the patrol car knows. The line ended. Chatty guy isn't he? I muttered but at least I got something. NCPD is actually showing up? I didn't expect that. June muttered as he caught up with me. Yeah. You ever heard of the meat man? June blinked and then frowned. Yeah, a little. Urban myth? I think this guy was him, at least he seemed very interested in what the news said about him. I'm glad you put a bullet in him, June said simply with a nod and to my surprise he reached out and squeezed my shoulder. You did good. But we should probably get out of here before the cops show up. You can if you want. But I'm staying. To make sure. June let out a sigh and nodded settling into wait. The next twenty minutes were mostly spent doing three things. Checking on the two people that still hadn't woken up but at least were still breathing. Long silences. And explosions. I was trying to disable the damn mines, by breaching them and wasn't getting too far. They actually kept exploding on me, but at least as I tried I was getting rid of them, and of course I was getting the wrong XP alerts. 100 engineering XP gained. I was doing the quick hack breach, but getting engineering XP, damn it system. I need a manual. Where is my prima official guide? I shook it off and kept working, at least I was getting something, and engineering was awesome. Then we heard it. The roar of a car coming down the road. June I'll flag them down. No, June said suddenly grabbing me and holding me back. Just let them work at their own pace. NCPD don't like people walking up to them. He told me holding me back as he rested against the barn wall. Fine, I agreed it made sense. I guess. The gate was already open and the flashing lights of the car suddenly turned in, but stopped before coming close. Two officers stepped out both waving flashlights, one with a pistol in his off hand, and the other carrying a copperhead. The assault rifle had a powerful flashlight on the end and he was waving it around, but kept an eye on June and I. Both men were like startled cats, looking at every step. I guess the warning about mines had gone through. That and the many craters that now littered the yard. Finally both officers got close enough and lit June and I up, despite both of us being under a light. No sudden moves. Put your hands up, one roared and I felt June obey begrudgingly and I quickly followed after. The two officers approached and actually forcefully put us both on our knees and started handcuffing us both. I could feel June muscles tense beside me, but I just turned and gave him a smile which had him relax. Evening officers. I mentioned despite grunting around the harsh hands handcuffing my hands behind my back. The two. Quiet. The guy handcuffing me snapped, and I was thankful that he didn't actually strike me like he motioned to. Not because I was worried about him hurting me. Funnily enough I actually knew ways to break free of handcuffs. Ninjutsu as always being the MVP. No, I was worried June would have ripped the cuffs off and started beating the cops to death. A few moments later we were both secured by the officers and the one with the handgun went into the barn to look around. He came out a minute later cursing and the two officers pulled away to speak in rushed whispers to each other. Although at least in the end they grabbed their radio and started sending messages along. Told you we should have left, June whispered side eyeing me. It's fine. Just a. Okay they are idiots, but hopefully this will all go well once the detective gets here, I said, voice filled with hope. Things did not in fact get better when stints did show up.